Hello and welcome to the 2020 CAPE Academic Symposium. Um, it's great that everybody is able to join us virtually. It's too bad we're not able to, to enjoy each other's company in person, um, but looking forward to a uh, fantastic few hours of discussion on developing research capacity and enhancing research impact in emergency departments across Canada. Um, we wanted to extend some special thanks uh, to the uh, CAPE staff, specifically Shanna Scarrow and Kelly Wyatt, uh, who have been instrumental in, uh, in getting this uh, virtual academic symposium together, uh, and to Jeff Allen for facilitating and managing the technical aspects, uh, so thanks very much. Uh, to members of the CAPE Research Committee uh, who provided uh, input on the, the format and substance of uh, the discussion for the day, uh, and to the CAPE Board and staff um, for uh, making, for providing the technology uh, and uh, supporting uh, uh, the academic symposium uh, to, to make this happen virtually today. Um, so our objectives are to present three symposium papers and to receive feedback. Uh, the first paper is going to be uh, how to optimize collaborative relationships in emergency medicine research. Uh, the second will be uh, starting, building, and sustaining a program of research in emergency medicine in Canada. And the third will be how can quality improvement and research scholars work together to improve their respective projects and lead to greater impact. And I'll be turning it over very shortly to the, uh, the leads of those panels. There are a number of ways to provide feedback uh, to the panel presenters. Uh, encourage people to, to use the chat function as they're able to. We'll also be presenting uh, QR codes and uh, poll software that will allow people to provide feedback in real time. And so, Looking forward to a uh, fantastic uh, discussion. And with that, we'll turn it over to our first panel uh, led by Drs. Jeff Perry and Ian Steele. So take it away, Drs. Perry and Steele. So this first panel is on how to optimize cl collaborative relationships in emergency medicine research. So collaboration in uh, emergency medicine research, and indeed any research, is critical to its success. And so the objectives of this panel were to, one, know how to utilize best practices to lead a collaborative team to write a successful grant application. To know what comprises optimal study communication and dynamics during an active study. To know how to optimize abstract writing and polishing and to be able to describe optimal manuscript writing collaboration. So for this panel, we assembled experts from across Canada, uh, conducted literature reviews where we reviewed um, any evidence uh, from emergency medicine in Canada, across the world, as well as other um, fields in medicine for, for optimal research uh, methods. We drafted recommendations. We then sought feedback from emergency medicine researchers in Canada. We did this through um, directed uh, poll uh, um, survey. We then looked at NICER meeting in February where we had people in person either conduct uh, an online uh, feedback or on paper. And there we had not only emergency medicine researchers, but we also had research managers, research coordinators, research assistants, um, provide additional feedback and different perspectives. We then refine the recommendations through an iterative fashion. And today's the final step where we're again seeking additional uh, feedback from you today on, on uh, our proposed recommendations. So you can give us some feedback through the online chat. We, there's also going to be a QR code coming up, which you can scan um, and provide uh, further feedback. So our panel consisted of uh, Corinne Hall, Christian Vancourt, Jacques Lee, Venkatesh Thurgana Sambander Murthy, Marcel Lemont, uh, Ian Steele, and Judy Morris. So 
So here's that QR code. So if you're able to scan it now, that would be fantastic. Um, if you don't get a chance in, to do it before I change the slide in a few moments, it will show up again. Just jot down your notes on the side or put them in the online chat. So the first uh, uh, part here, writing a grant, was Corinne and myself that led this part. So our recommendations are to prepare uh, for the grant by completing a systematic review, do all necessary surveys, and collect pilot data wherever feasible. Well, obviously, this is a lot of work and not always possible. But with the systematic review, uh, it's very important to prove that there is a need for the research. Um, this could be from someone else's systematic review or your own work. Um, at the very least, you need to do a very comprehensive literature review, but ideally a, fully, a full systematic review is best. Survey, so if there's a question about what is the optimal outcome, what is the, uh, what is the meaningful difference between current practice and what uh, you're proposing, and will do physicians think that they'll actually use your, your work? Uh, any of these may be uh, suitable for survey. This may be, again, a big complex international survey of multiple groups of uh, users, or it may be more of a national survey of one group, or maybe a quick and dirty survey where you're really looking at the physicians at, a, uh, at some of your uh, proposed study sites where at least get some extended uh, feedback. Again, the more the better. Collecting pilot data, this shows that you can actually do what you're planning to do. And so this is very critical and reviewers um, view this um, very favorably if you can collect some pilot data to show that you can actually get data on your topic. Then assemble your team, make sure you're including patients, uh, including all uh, experts of different fields. Um, write the grant early. Uh, and share this with co-investigators to get their feedback, incorporate their feedback, have the grant reviewed by someone external to your study team to get a different perspective. You can get very tunnel vision when you're writing these things and kind of not necessarily see things from all sides. Ensure that you have institutional representatives uh, have been notified and that you are aware of their internal procedures and deadlines. Consider their deadline your deadline, not the granting agencies. Uh, good deadline. Project management, uh, it's very critical that you have somebody organized, making sure that all the different components of the grant are recognized and that they're, uh, someone's plotting their, their uh, task completions so that you are making progress and that you're not missing any um, of the required elements. This, we say this every two weeks, but this might be even more frequently if, you're, if your timeline is compressed. Um, uh, from a deciding to apply for a last minute grant that just came out, for example. Uh, COVID is a very good example of this where people have to scramble with very little um, notification that a grant was even going to exist. So in which case the milestones you would be reviewing every uh, week to even multiple times in a week. Maintain communication with all co-applicants co regarding the decision. So once it goes in, make sure you share the, the scientific uh, reviews and uh, you discuss this and I arguably don't lose momentum. Once the grant goes in, assume it's not gonna get funded and keep strengthening the proposal. Do your systematic review, do your survey work, do your feasibility um, uh, and pilot data collection while waiting for a decision, which could take four to six months to get back. So this is our suggested timeline. Um, I'll just pull this up uh, into something that you can see a little bit better. So. At six months, you want to have assembled your core team members. Um, make sure that you've thought about what your, your methods are going to be, uh, what your main outcome is, uh, what your sample size is, uh, how many sites you're going to require. You're kind of bringing in all the key um, players that you need for the grant uh, and all the site investigators as you uh, identify the need for more sites. By three months, you should have this pretty refined and have a very mature initial one draft page summary. So this should be fairly mature at this point. Um, the principal applicant should recruit any remaining sites that haven't already been identified and brought on board. And um, you should be clarifying all roles and responsibility and have this sort of uh, project manager keeping the checklist of items and meeting every two weeks from this point forward. Two months, 
you want to have finished writing the draft protocol and be getting feedback from your, your entire study team. At the same time, if you can submit this to one or more REBs, um, especially one that can give you fairly quick turnaround times, um, that would be advantageous because then if you have uh, REB approval, then the, the reviewers don't have to focus on the ethics of the study. Confirm who's collecting the support documentation and have them be uh, collecting this. There we go. Um, by one and a half months, the budget should be drafted, including the budget uh, justification, um, and it should be reviewed by the core members. Make sure that you've asked for enough money, but not too much money where it's no longer fundable or it's in a high budget group where it's even more competitive to get the funding. Um, submit and draft protocol for internal review, um, identify and collect any required letters of support. And by one month, you should be sending out your final protocol um, or near final, I should say, for one last look at. There should not be major issues still at this point. It should be really fine tuning uh, at this point in time. Make sure you've got all your internal signatures at this point. And within about two weeks prior to submission, you wanna have somebody who's very skilled at proofreading review everything, including common CV, including your, your lay summaries or scientific summaries, um, the main protocol, budget, justification, everything to make sure that everything looks good, reads well, and that there's no errors present. And then it makes sure that everybody who's part of the study team gets a copy of this. So a few tips and tricks. Uh, think about adapting your protocol to, to apply for targeted funding announcements. Usually it's easier to get this funding. So that could be for diabetes, for um, Aboriginals, it could be for different groups. Um, Northern uh, Ontario sometimes, like there's different groups that can be um, targeted and your success rate is often much better. Don't ever start from scratch. Use a previous grant that's been funded as a template. Um, ensure that your grant has minimal to no abbreviations. It has to be easy to read. Assume that somebody smart is going to read this with no knowledge of your topic. Make sure you get a lot of feedback. This should be your co-investigators, your internal reviews, mentors. NICER is an excellent source uh, for, for external review. Uh, ensure to include senior investigators. Junior investigators going in on their own, it's very difficult to get funded, if not impossible. So make sure you do include your senior investigators. Uh, include all relevant areas of expertise. Biostatisticians, I've seen so many grants get um, get denied because they didn't have a biostatistician, it's critical. Think about a KT expert, an implementation science expert, a content expert, so cardiologist if it's cardiac, neurologist if it's neurology, et cetera. Um, make sure it's your rationale is, is well justified. You have to sell the need for this topic. It has to be pertinent and important. Um, do not ignore the lay and scientific summaries. These are the first things that the reviewers look at. If they're not done well, you're in trouble. Um, ensure to polish um, the final submission and standardized letters of support are not helpful. They have to be value added. If they're not gonna be individualized and say why this, this research is super important or why they can do it, they're not worth doing. Uh, most reviewers don't even look at these and those that do are gonna look at them very critically. So make sure they're done well. Let's pause there now for questions. Hi, everybody. It's Corinne. So far, no questions. Uh, everybody who can hear me, please do feel free to type any questions you may have into the chat function. Hello, Corinne. It's Patrick, uh, Jeff, and Pat. Um, thank you for a great presentation. Um, I had a question about submitting to REB in advance, uh, very early, before having a, a formal or finalized protocol. Um, my experience from different ethics committees is that they want that final protocol. I, I just wanted to hear you about what you're um, what you were thinking about by submitting early to, to REB. So I can uh, answer that question, Pat. Uh, it's something that I have started to do um, with our rewarding success grant that was funded in 2019. Uh, we were for the first time submitting a randomized control trial where we were asking for a waiver for informed consent. So we knew that the reviewers were going to comment about whether or not this was going to fly through the ethics board. 
And so what we did is we did exactly what Jeff is suggesting. We actually submitted the protocol to our ethics board and we did that about six months in advance of the final competition deadline. I don't think we would have gotten funded if we hadn't done that. And effectively, we then attached the, the, um, the, uh, the ethics certificate into the appendix. Um, it forces you to be early. And one of the big things that I find in, in my mentorship of, of more junior investigators is this tendency to delay and not set really hard deadlines for ourselves. If you can force yourself through an ethics application to get that grant, scook them and get the protocol finalized, you know, five, four, even three months before the submission deadline, you're way ahead of the curve. May, I don't you. know if I can add a little bit to this, Patrick, as well. We will talk about this on the next section as well. Uh, what your experience might be, and this is ours as well, is that sometimes the ethics board are actually reluctant to take on a full review of a protocol without confirmation, and it's actually been funded already. Uh, but what we've done in the past, at least at our institution, uh, is when an ethics question was raised by reviewers at the first uh, grant submission, so to speak, we made a point that their help in reassuring reviewers in a subsequent review was, was uh, going to be extremely well uh, received and, and required. So if your institution has a tendency to only review uh, projects which are funded already, this is an argument you can try to bring on with them to say that this is, as Corinne said, um, something that will help your success. Thank you, very, very interesting. Thank you very much. And Andrew has also a suggestion to target multiple synergistic funding opportunities. So I think that's a great suggestion, Andrew. So even if you are targeting a CIHR grant, you may be able to get seed funding from other institutions like, like CAPE or a provincial funder. And so you may actually be able to list on your ethics application that you already have seed funding, which may help address Christian's point. Yeah, I think that's super important, uh, Andrew, that you do sort of plan for aim for the sky, but also plan for plan B and maybe even plan C where you're kind of looking to try and get um, your funding together and get the things off the ground. And that may give you more feasibility study, uh, feasibility data, which will then enhance your chances of success. So again, super important. And the other thing for me, I find with the ethics review, ethics is um, the, the one committee that is guaranteed to not um, have only emergency physicians on it. So it's going to be reviewed by a nephrologist, by a basic scientist, by the head of ethics. So it's a perfect test um, to see whether or not your your protocol as written is actually understandable. So I think it's highly useful, almost like as a peer review tool as well. Any other questions or thoughts from the audience? So we'll just say one last thing for Patrick. It, different ethics boards work differently and some are faster than others. Some frown on not having funding before getting funding. So if one of your sites is easier to get this and you know that from past experience from, from your PIs, you, you may not want to get the ethics where the PI is. You may want to get ethics approval somewhere else, but you just need to get, if you can get one ethics approval, that's going to make most of the ethics questions of the grant disappear and get that off, uh, off the table, which is helpful. And if we have time, maybe uh, Shelley had a, a comment, and, and I think. Um, so I'll just read it out loud. If your home institution has a research office, it is helpful to have someone unfamiliar with your grant go through it for clarity and readability. Absolutely, Shelley. I couldn't agree more. They can also check that your budget aligns with human resource requirements. Um, I think that's a really good idea. Uh, it's not something that that uh, is offered in terms of our review process because human resources is usually managed by the PI, but I think that that's a great idea. If you have that resource available to you, pretty much I would, I would say thank you to any resource like that that's available to provide some critical feedback. Jeff, I don't know if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, if the more, again, the more feedback you can get, the more eyes on your proposal and all the different angles of it, the better your proposal is going to be. So the, the more um, resources like this that you can take advantage of, the better. Great. So I think we'll uh, maybe move on to the next um, uh, group, group within this panel. Over to Jacques. 
All righty. Uh, let's see. I'm unmuted, I think. The camera's on, I think. Hey, everybody. Uh, let's see now if I can advance this slide. There we go. Um, what an honor. Uh, God, it's amazing to speak to you, hardworking emergency physicians and clinician scientists. And thanks for Jeff and Ian. That was a really amazing thing. I learned a lot. Um, and uh, I don't know if anybody else is like their heart rates up because it's like, oh my God, how can I do this? Right. You know, these lists of best practices, you know, like they are goals to work towards. Okay. Um, and this is the part of the talk where I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to give you about 20 uh, bullet points that were developed by the consensus pro process that you heard about, you know, as recommendations. And these are great aspirational goals and they will improve your collaboration and no, you may not necessarily be able to achieve all of them, but you should be working towards it. And I think I'd be completely remiss if uh, I didn't, you know, we talk about the what you need to do, but just a few words on the how you need to do it. This is about collaboration, okay? There is a huge evidence base about how to lead an effective team, an effective collaborative team. And it's two things I'm gonna give you to take, take away. One, authentic leadership. What's an authentic leader? An authentic leader treats their people with respect. Um, they are um, feeling not manipulated, you know, but led. Okay. So two really important things about authentic leadership. And number two, creating safe space for communication from your team. Everybody on your team has to feel like they can contribute. The Exxon Valdez crash and the KAL uh, plane crash, both the co-pilots in those situations knew that a crash was imminent but didn't feel free to speak. All right, so enough about that before I get the hook. Let's see if this will still, there we go. Uh, hang on, overreacted. Okay, so congratulations, you've received a grant. You're an incredibly elite group. Um, um, and the first thing you wanna do is inform your investigators and the grant officers at the institution that you were successful. It's really helpful if you send out the details, as was mentioned, send the grant uh, approval number, the recommendation, uh, the reviews to all of your participants. That'll really help their uh, CVs. Update your budget. Um, if you didn't ask for 25% more than you need to do the stu study, uh, you're going to be disappointed because you always get a haircut. Okay, so uh, that can lead to uh, serious problems if you were really um, not realistic in your original budget. Now you have to do something that was going to be a stretch for, with 25% less. And now you need to fill all the staffing needs um, and recruit people. Manpower is a huge problem. And again, this is something that um, a, you know, a success, successful team will be uh, doing ahead of time. You know, it's really hard to, to find people, qualified people all of a sudden. And space can be a huge issue, not to mention specialized equipment. Okay. So um, now this has been said, this is very institution specific. You know, you have to have ethics approval. It is really good to have it beforehand because uh, it, especially if you're, if you're as a non-standard approach, like you're trying to get a uh, waiver of consent, a lot of reviewers would just say uh, no. So you have to have a letter from an REB saying that, that they've approved your approach. Legal contract. Um, if you're, so what this is about is uh, data transfer uh, agreements, material transfer agreements, um, and intellectual property agreements. Um, your institution have lawyers, they have to be involved early, they take a long time. Um, and um, if you're going to be shifting materials or genetics or something, it's a whole different world which you should be aware about. Okay. Um, so uh, once you've got the grant as well, now you have to get your team trained up. Um, you have to make sure that they're uh, familiar with the REB approved protocol and SOPs, which uh, I learned means standard operating procedures. So beyond your protocol, you have to actually lay out specific uh, details of how you're going to do this. Um, uh, update CVs. Um, and uh, if anybody doesn't know what TCP uh, S2 is, you know, the tri council policy statement, you know, that's just basically this is. Um, a document, a website that shows that you understand the ethics of uh, conducting research and your research assistants have to have that certification. So look, 
you know, the season comes around, I'm very bad at this, but some of the people on your team are more peripheral or some of the, the people on your team are highly successful. Like Jeff's always on about 15 different grants. So you really have to re-engage and go, hey, remember we talked about this grant two years ago? Well, we're going now. All right. Um, so uh, Christian turned me on to this thing called a delegation of tasks document. Okay. So what that is, is a very detailed line by line document. And we'll try and make an example available afterwards where you write every, it comes from the um, uh, pharmaceutical research realm, but we try and make uh, a line by line. These are all the jobs that need to be done in the study. And these are all the people who are capable of doing it. When you make such a document, it's really important to cross train people. If you have only one person on the delegation of tasks, document who can do a job what happens if they get sick right what happens if they leave so um and there can be some budget um, problems if you have several studies uh going it's good to have overlap so uh funding from one grant can flow to another grant if the, if the first study was done early okay the next thing um uh, as part of being effective in running a team is to have uh committees uh, and committees basically are governance structures to make decisions for the grant, you know, so it's not just, you know, um, I think we should do this way. You're not re really going to get the advantage of all the good people on your team. All right. So some of the um, committees you could think about safety monitoring, if that's necessary, a steering com committee, a publications committee to decide how to publish um, and uh, a stakeholders and patient engagement very important uh, that, that you have feedback from the people who are affected by the results of your study. Um, and many institutions have an official green light process, meaning they have to have sign off from REB, uh, corporate ethics, privacy officers uh, usually, and that this green light needs to be given before you engage in any study activity. So that's institution specific, but just be aware, not only of your own institution's policies, but all the other sites that need to be up because uh, that might delay somebody coming into the study and that can be a big problem. All righty. Um, so, uh, you know, now that you've got the money, you've formed all the committees, you've been in touch, you've re-engaged, um, uh, now you're actually going to start setting out a timeline, you know, and uh, you've done this as part of your grant, uh, developed a timeline. It needs to be updated. Maybe that was uh, a grant cycle ago. Uh, maybe some institutions dropped in, in and you've added others. Um, so these are these are some of the, maybe you got COVID-19. Let me tell you, that was a interesting update we had to do. Um, um, you have to follow your institution's rules about paying for services, you know, the accounting. Um, it's really important to have some help on that. Um, um, and then Use the committees, communicate with your team, um, hold regular meetings, uh, distribute mi minutes, and really um, a newsletter, you know, kind of a, a raw, raw is super important to keep your uh, uh, team engaged, up to date with what's going on. Um, uh, and uh, Marcel is great for this, uh, involved in his studies. Um, we got amazing studies. They also showed us our relative. Um, enrollment rates, which got a little bit of the competitive juices flowing, you know, to pick up our socks. Um, and that was very uh, effective. Um, so uh, every year, typically, you have to renew your REB. Um, you may, if you've, you should have, if it's a randomized trial, registered your trial uh, with a registry like clinicaltrials.gov, and you may need to update those as well. Um, um, and keep all the sites informed about the milestones. Like we just finished enrolling our last patient. Um, let your statisticians have a little bit of lead time. Hey, I'm gonna be sending you, you know, 18 uh, megabytes of data here um, uh, or 250. Um, and when, what, when is your schedule clear to do this analysis, okay? And then if there are paper files, um, you need to keep those files for you know seven to ten, five, seven, ten years, depending on your institution. So if you've got thousands and thousands of forms, you need to have a place to put them, uh, and you're legally required to keep them in a safe, locked environment. Okay, so I think that was uh, under time. 
Um, uh, thank you for your attention. Um, thank you for doing uh, clinical science um, and happy to he hear and try and answer any questions. Thanks, Doc. We're, I'm just monitoring the chat. Uh, feel free to send us questions now. We may have time for only a couple of them just to leave enough time for the other panelists. Uh, just remember, there will be also a QR code later in the presentation where you can leave us also uh, your, your feedback um, uh, on the survey. Uh, so we'll have to leave ourselves to only one or two questions if we can see some in the chat. Uh, we don't have any questions in the chat as of yet being told. And this might possibly be a good opportunity to move on to the next panelists, I guess. Unless there are <laughs> questions in the live stream chats. All right, let's move on to the next group. Thanks, Jacques. Thank you very much, um, uh, everybody. Thanks for this opportunity. I am presenting on behalf of Marcel um, uh, and myself as the as the uh, lead people who looked at how to write an abstract. Now you've done all of this work, you've collected the data. Now is a time where you just have a little peek at the data yeah. and probably put together some results and tell it to a national and international audience in the form of an abstract where you can give, get feedback before you write the final paper when it goes out to the entire world. So it's a very important opportunity, uh, which we suggest that you don't miss. So communicate with your investigators that you're intending to submit an abstract. Sometimes some conferences have a limit to the number of authors that you can include. If you've got to cut down some authors, develop a rationale and tell why some of the authors could not be included in the abstract. Um, we suggest that you draft the abstract and get all the results in a document and circulate it to the co-authors for feedback. Once the feedback is given, like incorporate the feedback, do a second draft, and then finalize your abstract. Share the final versions of your abstract with all the co-authors. And um, once it is submitted, it goes through a process of selection. And once the conference uh, presentation is selected, then inform all the co-authors that our abstract has been selected for publication and as well as for presentation. I'll tell also them whether it's going to be a presentation or a poster. This is a time where you have to request a lot of names of study personnel who are involved in the study in recruitment and data collection, day-to-day -day activities of the study, where you should acknowledge them in the presentation or in the poster. Develop the presentation and the order poster and give it to all the co-authors for review and feedback. Once you've got all the feedback, finalize the poster uh, or the presentation so that you can present it in front of a bigger audience that's at a national level or an international level. During the presentation, you're going to get important feedback about your study questions, how it can be framed a little better, and how the analysis can be, can be presented and as well as how the results can be interpreted. That feedback is very important that you should probably bring it back to the co-authors and you should um, uh, incorporate all the feedback that is given by this wider audience who's out of this study team um, in the manuscript before you submit the manuscript. We have some timeline suggestions for the abstract submission. Start about a month ahead of time where you inform the investigators uh, about the intent to submit. About two weeks prior to the deadline, circulate the draft and the results. Um, about nine days or 10 days before, we suggest that the co-authors provide feedback because it's a short document of about like 200 words. Usually four days is more than enough time for the co-authors to provide feedback. About one week prior, you should be able to finalize the abstract and we should be able to submit it. And when the results are out, inform your co-authors about the results and as well as send them the citation details so that they can put it in their CV. Finally, when you're presenting, once again, acknowledging all the people who are involved in the study is an important uh, aspect that you, we must do and uh, bring the feedback so that it can be incorporated into the manuscript. 
And uh, that will be about writing and submitting an abstract. I'm open to any questions. Thanks, Venk. Maybe just a very quick comment, something that I've learned from the past. Presenting an abstract has, has a lot of uh, positive uh, things attached to it. Uh, networking, also getting comments from the audience before you write the manuscript. Uh, but if you are to present something that involves either a database review or health records review, just make sure you actually draft and submit your manuscript in less time than it would take someone in the audience to do the work with a larger database and what you've presented. And then get the, uh, the, Ottawa, the Ottawa abstract rule, you know, that you should have a manuscript ready within a year of the, of the abstract. It's something I've always struggled with, but a great suggestion. Yeah, so actually, like um, um, some of the things that I have done is I have a draft manuscript while I'm presenting to the conference um, so that all the feedback can be incorporated and it is ready for submission. Many times I've submitted the abstract, which is actually the abstract of the manuscript that I've written. That's a great suggestion. Keeps your timeline on the go. Quick question about if we can present at more than one venue. Um, yes, that's an important question. It depends on the conference. I think there is an agreement between SAEM and CAPE that um, uh, you're going to submit the same abstract during the same year, um, um, that there will be no problems. So even though if it is like one month apart, there will be no problems in the form of presenting the abstract in, at SAEM and CAPE. But whereas if you're going to present in a European conference and then after six months later, you're going to present in a Cape conference or SAM conference, that may not be allowed um, because the abstract has already been um, uh, presented. There, there may be also another issue in the form of um, publication. If the, if the paper is already published, the abstract may not be accepted for presentation. I think that is uh, one question. Uh, you should point out the value of uh, sending an abstract to a peer review conference that will publish it. Yes. So um, uh, it will be really good if it is a peer review conference and it will publish it in a conference proceedings and it will add a lot more value. Um, uh, uh, that means it's a bigger conference. You're going to get more feedback Plus, as an investigator, you can also put it in a CV and show it that you have um, disseminated at a national and international level. I will stop there and have the next go on to the uh, next um, section. So, uh, folks, uh, we're going to talk about how to write a manuscript, and that could be like a, a one-year course, of course. I, I want to thank my uh, co-lead, uh, Judy Morris, who has been very helpful as well as everybody else who's provided feedback uh, to this. Uh, we're assuming that uh, most papers that you're gonna write involve uh, more than one author, most of the time, unless it's an editorial or a commentary perhaps. And we're gonna on a scientific uh, uh, manuscripts, okay? So original research, whether it be clinical research, education, or uh, quality improvement type, where you're uh, presenting the results of a, a study. And uh, these are tips that are based on best practices, our consensus, I'd say on the whole panel, our panel, uh, there is probably, uh, we have probably jointly published over a thousand papers. So we've been around the block a couple of times. There's more than one way to do it, uh, but we think uh, these tips will help you uh, quite a bit. Don't worry uh, if there's too many tips because it's all going to be published in your favorite journal, CGEM, shortly. With that, we're trying to get the slide to change. There we go. Okay. So here are our recommendations. So early, early on, uh, let it be known that you're going to write a manuscript and confirm authorship. This uh, has been mentioned, starts with the grant and then sure while you're doing the study and uh, comes up again when you're submitting an abstract and uh, um, and then when it comes to the actual manuscript itself. Uh, so the way we approach it, as soon as we have the results and, and uh, you can't write a paper without 
your results all tabulated and finalized and perfect because otherwise you don't know what you're writing about. But share share these tables with your uh, co-investigators. And then the trickiest part often for some folks is what do these results mean? Because you have to interpret them and, and present uh, a compelling uh, summary of what they mean to, in your paper. Of course, you want to talk about what uh, is the best journal. And again, we could have a one hour seminar on how you do that. We tend to go by uh, uh, content area and impact factor. If we have a large multi center study, then we're going to aim for one of the really high impact factor uh, journals like New England or uh, JAMA or whatnot. But most of our studies are not going to be there. So uh, if you go with emergency, uh, the highest uh, impact is, is annals. We highly recommend uh, that you have a professional biostatistician help you with your results. They may help uh, identify errors or uh, help you with more sophisticated analyses that will hopefully uh, enhance the, the paper in the view of the journal. Uh, so I believe in writing the whole thing. Uh, we, uh, we teach writing in sections, uh, but write the whole thing before you start showing it around to people. And, uh, you know, if you're, you're new in the business, then, then go over it with a mentor or a senior colleague who has a lot of publishing experience. And then you want to send it to all the authors, okay? Uh, but again, make it complete because if, you know, it's incomplete or missing sections, you get a lot of useless feedback saying, hey, uh, where's, the, where's the conclusions or where's the tables? Uh, and the way we do it in Ottawa is we give the, authors, uh, the other authors two weeks. And, and that date is right in the subject line of the email. And, uh, you know, that's how we do it, two weeks. And probably in the second week, as you're approaching that deadline, remind people of that deadline because that's about when they really start to take it seriously. So you get all your feedback, and if you have a large group of authors, this is a lot of work because you want to go through every single comment and uh, whatnot uh, and uh, write a second draft, and send it out again, and maybe give them one week to comment on it. But again, uh, usually two drafts is good enough, but uh, occasionally I've seen this go on and on and on for quite a while before everybody is happy. getting ready to submit, you've got to look, excuse me, you got to look at the requirements. So they, they vary quite a bit in word uh, count or in the length of the abstract or the subheadings. And, and it drives us crazy at CJAM if we get a paper that's all formatted for JAM or something. And uh, so try, you've got to make it uh, acceptable to the journal if you want them to take it seriously. Uh, we uh, are fortunate in Ottawa, we have, uh, a research facilitator who uh, oversees submission uh, for us for all articles from our department. Um, so she's really good at this um, because there's a lot of little mistakes and picky things with different uh, journals. Uh, and once you've sent it in or ready to send in, be sure all the authors get the final version. So they have it uh, while you're awaiting uh, the decision. Uh, as soon as the decision comes back, either good or bad, let everybody else know. And uh, if it's revise and resubmit, great. Uh, if it's uh, reject, then, uh, you know, you decide if you really want to make revisions and what should be the next uh, journal to submit it to. We don't recommend making a lot of revisions because what happens is that um, you'll get a new, whole new set of uh, uh, review or comments the next journal. Uh, if it's accepted, make sure everybody gets to see the proof that their uh, affiliations are correct. Uh, when you know what's coming out, let everybody know because some sites want to have a press release and don't like being taken by surprise. And once it's published, uh, get a nice PDF uh, to all your uh, to all your authors. So I think I'm uh, done in the nick of time and. Um, if we have time for a few questions, that would be wonderful.
there are no questions, however, please uh, make sure you uh, scan the QR code when it's going to show up again and give us your uh, comments. It'll be much appreciated. There's a question, question about choice of journals. Yeah, I'm not sure what you meant uh, by that, Jacques, but I, I mean, uh, if it's a really good paper, we go by impact factor. We have all our favorite journals. Uh, a lot of our resident papers get uh, shopped around to innumerable emergency medicine journals. I'd like to convince the Canadian audience, if you have an emergency medicine type article, maybe send it to Annals, but if that doesn't work, then please send it to CGEM next. So uh, we're getting better and better. But we have a list of about 10 other emergency medicine journals around the world. Uh, if you're really stuck, you can always find a home for your paper. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. That was uh, fantastic and, and uh, panel with uh, some great tips there. Uh, just being in uh, conscious of time, I think it's time for us to, to move on to uh, our next presentation led by Dr. Phil Davis, who's going to be talking about uh, starting, building, and sustaining a program of emergency medicine research. Um, and uh, so we'll turn things quickly over to Phil and he can uh, provide the introduction and, and see the rest of this. Okay, well, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, my name is Phil Davis, I'm from the U of S and our second panel today is on starting, building and sustaining a program of research in emergency medicine in Canada. So I just wanted to introduce my panel. Uh, so from east to west, um, we start off uh, out east in Dalhousie with Dr. Alex Carter. Then we move on to Laval with Dr. Patrick Archambault. We have Dr. Marco Civilati from Queens, uh, Dr. Kirsten DeWitt from McMaster, Dr. Shelley McLeod from the U of T. Uh, from Western, we have Dr. Justin Yan, as well as Dr. Naveen Punai. Uh, from NOSM, Dr. David Savage. Uh, myself from USASC, and then rounding things out in Calgary, we have Dr. Edward McRae. For conflicts of interest, we have none. And so getting right into the background of things, so um, we really noticed that there was a gap in the literature um, and we noticed looking at the prior CAPE academic symposia that they'd really focused on building a program of research in established academic departments. And so really coming from a smaller center, we noticed that, um, you know, a lot of us noticed that there was a lack of guidance on how to foster and grow a program of research in smaller EDs without prior research experience or some kind of established infrastructure. And so really at the direction of the CAPE academic section, our panel really sought out to develop some recommendations for starting, building, and sustaining a program of research in centers without established prior research infrastructure. And so in terms of our methods, what we did was we established an expert panel of 10 EM researchers throughout Canada, uh, five of whom came from departments uh, with, with some recent experience in starting a program of research, and five coming from centers with established programs of research. Let's go back up there. So in terms of our methods, um, uh, really between November of 2019 and January of 2020, what we did uh, using a modified Delphi approach was that we came up with some draft recommendations um, as a group using a combination of teleconferences and email discussions. And then between January and March of 2020, we sought um, some external feedback just within our local networks. And then ultimately brought this back to the larger panel between March and May of this year. Uh, and revise these recommendations in iterative fashion. What became evident to us is that we not only needed tips for the researchers uh, at this point, but we also needed some tips for department heads on how they could help to foster uh, a growing program of research or a young program of research. And so obviously our goal was to prevent, present this at the uh, CAPE Academic Symposium in uh, June, but obviously life being what it is, uh, we're now presenting here to you virtually. Um, so we have a QR code for your feedback and after each um, sort of subsection of this talk, we're going to have some time for questions. But really the feedback we're hoping to get from everybody is, is one, does the temporal sequence of recommendations make sense to everybody? So where they're placed? Uh, is there anything missing? Um, and uh, really, are there any ideas that we should be elaborating on? 
Um, so I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Dave Savage, who's going to talk about uh, some tips for starting a program of research. Thanks a lot, Phil. Are you able to hear me okay? Oh. So um, today's talk is on, or my piece of the talk is starting a research program. Uh, I want to thank my section mate, uh, uh, Dr. Alex Carter, as well. I'd like to thank the the panel for incorporating me and including me in this uh, this great discussion. Uh, it's it's an honor to be part of a, a great group of uh, phys colleague physicians. So the first part of the talk is looking at get getting formal training um, in research. So that's our first recommendation. So. Uh, to start a program of research, having some formal research whether, research training, whether it's a master's or a PhD can be very important. The, the formality of going through and developing a research question, writing and applying for grants, uh, conducting a study, analyzing the study, and then disseminating the study are all parts of the graduate experience that will uh, give you a skill set that is uh, incredibly important to starting your own research program. The next one is finding research mentors. Now, finding a research mentor can be very difficult depending on where you work. So if you're in a large center, uh, you, you'll have colleagues that you can rely on to mentor you through uh, the beginning stages of your, of your research program. Uh, I myself am up in Thunder Bay and I'm sort of starting the program from scratch. So I've had to rely on uh, local physicians who aren't eMERGE physicians. So we have some, some successful uh, researchers who've been uh, who've had CIHR and PSI type grants. We have one physician in particular, she's a Rhodes Scholar, so she's excellent. And she's provided me with, with uh, some mentorship. And then relying on the greater EM community. So by attending meetings, uh, going to NICER, going to CAPE, uh, you meet people and, and they themselves can provide mentorship to you. Um, sometimes it can be um, formalized and sometimes it's just very much informal, you know, so, sort of side end of the table sort of discussions at dinner or uh, in a restaurant. So. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, they were switching fine before. There we go, sorry about that. So our, our third recommendation is, is related to obtaining group support from the physicians you work with. Uh, it's important for many reasons to uh, garner support from, these, from this group. Um, one of the things that we've recommended is trying to answer questions that are relevant to your group and, and important to them. And that way they'll be on your side and, and help support you through the process. As well, selecting studies that minimize the impact on the group themselves. Uh, I know with the group that I work with, if I were to bring a study in or, or, or try and conduct a study that's gonna have a significant impact on A, patient flow or B, their, their individual practice, I'd have difficulty, especially in the early stages so finding studies that minimize these two factors is, can be really important. And then the third is finding a, a naysayer. <clears throat> so this is somebody who, who uh, doesn't have interest in research, who, who may be trying to slow your progress and try and convert them into somebody who might, uh, who might be able to support you uh, can be an important, uh, important uh, strategy. Developing a niche. So this is the early stages of your career. You know, finding where your interest is and, and what you want to do can be really important. Uh, finding a niche uh, related to where your ED is located. So a regional niche or maybe a patient population niche uh, can be a, a good strategy. I work in Northwestern Ontario. We have a large indigenous population. Uh, I advocate that, that, that these are our niches, that, that the rural region, rural uh, medicine, rural eMERGE, as well as our indigenous population uh, all need significant um, focus from the research community. And so I've, I've been advocating amongst our physicians that this should be our sort of uh, strategy for building programs. And then if you have physicians who have interest or skills in specific methodologies, if you have researchers in your area that have uh, very specific skill sets, then, then that could 
should be uh, incorporated into your uh, strategy for building your niche. And then last of all, with our recommendations is, is basically starting small. So uh, you wanna go with studies that are gonna be less resource intensive. So uh, studies like retrospective uh, reviews, chart reviews, doing surveys, or maybe even a systematic review. Uh, all of these can be done without a lot of interference in your department. Uh, they can be quite, uh, quite fruitful as far as publications and, and, and highlighting your interests and, and building your program. Uh, but starting small is important to ensure that you're successful. Thank you. That's great. Thanks so much, Dave. Um, I'm just monitoring the chat here to see if you have any questions. So if anyone has any questions from the group, feel free to send them in. But there's an interesting side chat going on here. What Jock Lee had mentioned was virtual mentorship is much more possible in COVID. Uh, you're 100% right, as we're all getting used to this new new Zoom world. And then Jeff also mentions, Jeff Perry mentions, the CAPE academic section provides research consults, and the consultant can be optimized to someone with the most relevant expertise, which is an excellent point. And I think maybe we'll move on to Justin. Fantastic. Thank you, uh, everyone, and thanks, Shelley. Uh, good afternoon and good morning, everyone, uh, wherever you are in the country. Um, for those who don't know me, my, my name is Justin Yan. I'm an eMERGE physician uh, and researcher at Western in London. Um, so it's my pleasure to present the next uh, sort of sub-panel of our panel that's building a program of research, um, which takes over from what Dave has presented. I'm presenting this on behalf of uh, myself and Kirsten DeWitt, um, as we are the, the two that were the leads on this sub-panel. So our first tip that we uh, thought about uh, including was to secure funds. And it's so difficult to um, lead any kind of research program or start any kind of research program without any kind of funding. Um, in addition to infrastructure costs, uh, operating funds to actually conduct the research, it's really important for a budding researcher who wants to build a program to have some salary support not only for themselves, but also for any kind of research staff that they may, might have, including research assistants or coordinators. Um, it's also uh, important to have uh, funding for conferences and publication where necessary as well. Um, a lot of the time where the sources of funding start are oftentimes with the department itself. So you may have a, a chair chief who, um, you know, has a little bit of money to spend and is looking to support a researcher. And that's a really great way, great place to start. But other things that have been mentioned um, already are uh, research foundations, both on a provincial and national level, uh, a hospital foundation, as well as community partners, as well as from industry, if there's a specific area of research that um, a researcher is, is involved with. Um, although it's possible to build a research program without any funding, um, you know, our panel really thought that it was incredibly different to, difficult to do so. Um, because you really need some protected time to uh, focus on your work, uh, the writing and preparation of the, the uh, proposals and grants and protocols. Tip number two, uh, building a team. Um, to build a team, um, we thought that these were the various components that were important to include. Um, the research lead is, or the researcher, them, researcher themselves uh, is the ideas person who often sets the research agenda and writes, writes the protocols and grants and manuscripts and so on. Um, we thought that it was in, important to include research contributors as well. And by, by what, what we mean by research contributors are other uh, emergency physicians or, or nursing staff, for instance, who are in the department and may work clinically, um, who may have an identified area of improving care, but they, they themselves may not be the people who want to actually do the research themselves. Um, so these individuals might have some interesting ideas and uh, might want to run things by the research lead in terms of the actual logistics of doing a research project. And they can also help with mentoring resident projects as well. Um, having a research, research coordinator is also very important. And a coordinator in our mind is somebody who um, uh, you know, takes care of the day-to-day -day operations, um, can help with uh, ethics uh, applications, uh, liaising with research institutes, um, at your respective centers um, and communicating with other centers and arranging meetings as needed as well. 
research assistants um, can be either paid or volunteer. Um, and we've all, you know, or many of us have been research volunteers at some point in our careers, whether as a med student or a resident or even um, pre-med. Um, and the role of the research assistants is really to help with the data collection and entry, perhaps to um, help with identification and recruitment and enrollment of, patient, of patients, um, as well as, um, uh, um, you know, just general sort of function of an operation of the, uh, the actual project. Um, be careful with the research assistants that you uh, hire or have work with you. Some of them may require very close um, supervision and training if they're not, uh, uh, don't have previous experience with that. Number three, it's important to collaborate. So we feel, we felt very strongly that it's important to uh, do this on both a local as well as regional and national level. Um, locally within the department, as mentioned before, with respect to research collaborators, um, people who might have a specific focus on um, things like uh, POCUS, QI, MedEd as listed there, who also want to conduct research in those areas. Um, other clinical areas as well, such as cardiology, neurology, so on and so forth, trauma, ICU, um, who may want to collaborate with you, as well as non-clinical groups at your institution, those in social sciences, humanities, um, uh, IT and engineering and so on and so forth. Um, it's important with these clinic, other clinical areas in particular, just a little anecdote here in my experience, is that it's important to have an eMERGE department champion um, when, we're, when you're conducting a study that's being led by cardiology or neurology, for instance. Um, this will help to improve enrollment of patients as well as um, um, uh, just making sure that uh, the actual conduct of the research project is done according to what we are able to accommodate in the ED. Um, this research champion or this ED champion um, uh, who's helping out with these other clinical area research projects should also probably um, insist on co-authorship uh, so that they get the academic credit for the work that they're done. Um, anecdotally in London here, uh, we did have a cardiologist some years back who essentially told us that they were starting a study in our ED uh, with our patients using our resources and bed space. And that was quickly put to a stop right away because there was no input from uh, anyone in the emergency medicine community on this. So uh, it is something that I think if we are collaborating that we make sure that we're, we're helping or assisting with the actual protocol right from the get-go. From a regional and national level, um, uh, this was mentioned before as well, but participation in multi-center studies um, and, and projects that are going on at other places is really helpful for someone who's trying to build a program of research. And uh, we have some, some uh, uh, communities that are listed there, uh, depending on your interest. Um, NICER is a fantastic um, uh, uh, entity that I've been a part of since its inception um, that has uh, really been great for um, networking and collaborating on these group, uh, on uh, multi-center studies. And if your interest is in peds emerge or critical care or, or resuscitation outcomes, um, there's there are um, established networks um, and consortiums in place for those things as well. Number four, uh, publish. We thought it was a reasonable goal to have uh, two to three papers a year as either first or last author. Um, uh, particularly, uh, you know, if you're having medical students that you're supervising and, and residents and so on. Um, uh, as much as possible, publish in the journals that have as high impact factor as possible and open access if possible as well. Um, a final thought, and this was a little bit of an afterthought for us, but we have included this as, as a tip. So we'd love your feedback on this final, final tip. But we felt that it was important to, uh, for someone building a program of research to expect some failures. Um, as has been alluded before, as a researcher, you're gonna be rejected. Um, grant applications are mostly un unsuccessful um, and uh, not every study will get published, particularly in the journal that you wanted to get published in. So it's important during that time of um, discouragement to lean on your mentors, um, take time to self-reflect and regroup, um, to lean on your peer group as well in order to um, uh, you know, uh, regroup and uh, focus on, on your objectives and goals. I think that's all I have. I'm gonna pass, or uh, yeah, I'm gonna pass that on to Naveen, I believe is the next speaker. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Um, so my name is Naveen Punai. Thanks a lot, Justin. 
Uh, my name is Naveen Punai, and um, I am a pediatric emergency medicine researcher. Um, and uh, so now I'm going to sort of take you guys through now that you've built a program of research and you've got some publications under your belt and you've probably got some uh, uh, grants under your belt too. Um, how do we sustain that success and how do we pass that on to the next generation? So I've got a few slides here on the tips and I just want to thank uh, the rest of my uh, panel uh, um, for all your input. Um, it was a pleasure working with you. One of the things that you want to do is you want to be able to build the next generation of researchers. So at this point, you really want to become a mentor, but you have to be careful with who you bring into your mentorship fold. You want to be able to get them at the right level. So junior investigators are a great option because these are people who are really looking for mentorship and they're looking for a, an academic direction to match their clinical work. Uh, you can also look at medical students, um, undergraduate students and postgraduate trainees and international students as well, uh, because these people really, really want to get the work done for their own CVs, but it will also inspire them to embark on a career as a clinical investigator. And this really is a win-win situation. Not only does it help to advance your research program, it builds a cohort of colleagues that you will probably work with in the future but it also looks very good for you and your institution that you are investing in the next generation. These people can also undertake courses and are probably funded to do things like this, to undertake courses uh, that can serve as expertise for your future work. So let me just see if I can advance this. That's great. Um, so uh, you really want to take advantage of your leadership role. And at this point in your life, you have a pretty good CV. And you want to leverage that to look for uh, how well you can get your time protected. Um, you're an expert clinical investigator, but uh, uh, you need protected time to maintain your well-being. And that's when you have to approach your, uh, your chief chair of your department uh, to ensure that. And you can also look for endowed chairs position within your university because every university in Canada uh, adjudicates these. You really want to build on the success of your research team. We've mentioned this on a number of slides before. Uh, so patient engagement specialists and KT specialists, um, a statistician, a methodologist if possible, and of course, uh, your coordinator, your project manager, and your research volunteers. Now, these strong collaborative relationships will serve you very well in the future, but it's important to look not only within your ED and within your department, uh, but also externally to other institutions. I'm an active member of Pediatric Emergency Research Canada, and most of my colleagues are actually outside of my institution, and I lean on them very heavily. You also want to solicit uh, invitations for peer review. You know, you've probably done a lot of peer review as a guest editor, but what you really want to do now is try to get on those editorial boards as the decision editor, try to get some uh, experience doing external grant reviews and try to be able to participate on, if not share, on data safety monitoring boards. At this point, you also want to make sure that you can start getting your name out nationally and internationally. And the best way to do that is to lead multi-center work. Now, this doesn't have to include multi-center clinical trials or multi-center cohort studies. What you can do is you can uh, become expert, an expert panelist on uh, implementing national guidelines or position statements or health, policy, uh, health policies for whatever your um, academic body is. You can also leverage your the weight of all that you've done at this point in your career to try to change ED culture over time. Uh, depending on your institution, research might not be a very heavy core component of your ED culture. And this will probably need to change to support you and the future generation of researchers. So you, you wanna be able to target new hires and uh, new leadership hires as well to see value in the research program. You can ask your department members to commit to some level of research, and that doesn't necessarily mean they have to start doing research. They can just serve as knowledge users in your expert panels to inform your trials or inform whatever type of research that you do. And you wanna be able to try to get your research message out there at local departmental meetings whenever possible to let people know what you're doing in your department. 
Uh, most of your funding and most of your support might actually come from your department. So you want to be able to be transparent about how uh, people's money and people's uh, time has uh, improved your research program and how it's benefited your department. We all know that researchers don't make departments money, but what they do is they raise the profile of your department and they also ensure that there's another generation of researchers coming along and they also help push people through academic promotions processes. And these are things you really wanna highlight. Last but not least, uh, the most important thing is not your CIHR grant. Uh, the most important things in life are your health and your family and your friends. So it's important to take time, uh, carve out time to spend with those valuable individuals. And you're always at this stage in your career, you're always going to be asked to participate on various things. So you want to be very careful about what you say yes to. Um, you have to make sure that it contributes uh, to, uh, to, to your well-being and to the advancement of your research agenda. And you also want to be able to clarify uh, what these engagements involve and uh, what are the terms of these new roles. So thank you very much, everyone. And um, I look forward to your feedback on these, uh, on these slides. And uh, I'm going to pass, or somebody's going to pass you on to the next, uh, the next speaker. Thanks, Naveen. Always great tips. And thanks, Justin, as well. I just want to highlight a couple of things that have come up in the chat. So there was a, a question from somebody asking, as you develop your research program, how do you get naysayers or recent research ambivalent colleagues interested, which is a great question. And Christiane had written back in the chat that research is often the conduit to clinical practice change. So find something that naysayers care about and improve it through research protocol implementation. There was another comment from Jacques that just said, involve your clinical colleagues in the design and the choice of research projects. Often outlining the problem generates a lot of enthusiasm. And then there was a question from uh, Dr. Rohit Mohindra from North York General that asked, how do you pay for open access without these funded projects? So Naveen, I'm wondering if you want to answer that question. Um, so the question was, uh, remind me again, Shelly, how do you pay for open access? Correct. Good question. Yeah, so that's a great idea uh, or a great question. Uh, the best way to do that is in your grant. So um, uh, most grants, uh, they, want you to build a, uh, they want you to build a case for a KT um, platform and open access is one of those things. So uh, it's really important when you're writing your grants uh, to say what you're going to publish, where you're going to publish, and um, you want to put those funds as line items in your grant. Excellent answer. And we'll keep the chat going. But in the meantime, I think we'll hand it over to our next panel. Uh, so that is going to go back to Dr. Andrew McRae. Thanks very much. Um, so happy to present um, some recommendations for department leads uh, on behalf of my panel colleagues, Drs. Phil Davis, Shelley McLeod, and Marco Civilotti, um, especially for institutions that don't have a strong track record of research output or productivity. Um, it really does need to be engagement and support uh, from the academic and clinical leadership. And so we thought it was, was, was important to provide some advice for these individuals uh, in terms of uh, how best uh, to support uh, new and emerging researchers uh, in their department. And so the first, um, actually, the first, um, important point is that there needs to be uh, research as part of a departmental strategic plan um, and so and having a, a strategic plan for the the research uh, component of, of your department and first start with the why so why do, do you want your emergency department to engage uh, in research and where do your motivations come from uh, are you trying to build an academic portfolio and build uh, build an academic department um, for uh, to attract uh, bright young faculty who will be who will be uh, contributing to the knowledge base for emergency medicine um, and especially for as uh, um, as more and more institutions become involved in in academic activities and become teaching sites 
uh, for, uh, for medical schools. Um, there is a there is a, an impetus to to attract uh, young faculty who are going to be uh, both research leaders as well as as cutting edge educators, um, and so yeah, that's one uh, important reason to consider. It may be a, an expectation on the part of your your institution or your hospital, um, which is great because you can leverage that interest uh, from your institution or hospital. Uh, to possibly uh, uh, access um, some financial support. So if your if your health region uh, or your institution is saying uh, you need to to start doing research, um, a department head's response should be okay. Well, what can the hospital or the institution do for us to help make that happen? Um, you may be in a very fortunate situation where there is a philanthropic donor who who wants to fund research activities in an emergency department. Um, and so that may be uh, another consideration, uh, and they may very well have uh, some uh, agendas and priorities that will help you carve out a research niche uh, for your institution. Um, and you know, there may be uh, a view of, well, let's look at research as a path toward practice change or practice improvement uh, that can improve efficiency, uh, that can lead to departmental performance improvements that can can bring funding in, uh, and that will uh, you know that dovetails uh, or leads nicely into into the the panel that you'll be seeing after this uh, on how researchers and quality improvement specialists uh, can interact um, to enhance the uh, operational improvements and, and research impacts. And so, uh, as part of that consideration, is is what how do you define success? In, uh, in creating and, uh, and supporting a, a research program. Are, some, are you looking to attract new researchers, in which case you have a, a recruitment objective? Are you looking to have a, a product research productivity objective in terms of, of publications and recognition for your institution? Uh, or are you looking to achieve evidence-based operational improvements uh, using local uh, data? Uh, and so as part of your strategic plan, you, you, do, you do need to, to define what success in, in research is, is going to look like. Another key uh, or another important um, aspect of, uh, of supporting a research program, uh, it's been touched on already, is, is the critical role that uh, the departmental culture and other primarily clinically focused colleagues play uh, in achieving research success. Uh, and so research functions best in a department uh, that's operating well. Um, it's you know, in, a, in a department that's, uh, that's plagued by crowding and gridlock, um, adding on some of the operational components of doing research. So things like trying to recruit patients in the emergency department, um, and get physicians to fill out data, prospective data collection forms uh, can be incredibly challenging. And so probably the, the most important, one of the most important things that a, a, a departmental leader can do uh, in trying to promote uh, research is to just make sure that the, that the clinical environment is, is welcoming and suitable. Um, so trying to make sure that, that uh, clinicians aren't overwhelmed by, by crowding and clinical demands. Um, to allow them to, to be supportive uh, of research. You're not necessarily looking to turn every physician into, into a researcher, uh, but at least making sure that, uh, that uh, the environment is right, uh, that uh, physicians can be supportive uh, of the activities of their colleagues who are primarily focused on, uh, on research activities. Uh, and then showing the, the value added uh, for research. And so one of the comments in the chat earlier uh, was one way to get, uh, get research ambivalent colleagues uh, on board is, uh, is to show the, uh, the clinical practice improvement. Uh, and this is something that, that shouldn't be just the, the burden of the, the researcher to show the value of their work, uh, but this should be something that the departmental leadership should be championing that the uh, that research outputs will have uh, important uh, operational impacts and, uh, and improvements in, in quality of care uh, at your individual site uh, to, to allow the, uh, the researchers to, to foster the, the goodwill of, of their institution. Uh, 
Um, Naveen talked earlier about the importance of protected time. Um, it's really, really hard uh, to do research and do research well off of the side of your desk. Um, and so uh, this isn't just about ensuring that, um, that, patient, that uh, uh, clinician researchers um, have sufficient time in the day, um, but it's also about uh, recognizing that if you're working a, a full schedule of, of evenings and nights, it's going to be uh, really, really difficult um, to get uh, to get anything done, to interact with colleagues, uh, and and to collaborate. Um, if you're constantly exhausted after uh, after coming home at uh, 2 a.m. most nights. Um, and so not just uh, reductions in clinical workload, but optimizing shift schedules um, can be a, a huge, um, a, a, a huge, it can be a game changer for uh, clinician researchers. There are a number of departments uh, that allow um, individuals with major academic portfolios uh, to self-schedule. Um, and so that's a um, a, a huge benefit that lets people be productive and do the work that they that they need to do, um, and so uh, using that uh, that protected time, uh, not just in terms of uh, total hour reduction, but in terms of making your shift schedule uh, more uh, more conducive uh, to your your circadian rhythm to to let you be productive. Um, and having the necessary infrastructure. Um, so advocating for salary support from the institution uh, for clinician researchers, but also having some dedicated uh, funds, especially for people early on in their career, uh, some seed funding to people get it, to help people get a, a research program off the ground, um, because it's not realistic to pe for people to be able to compete for grant funds. Uh, early on in their career, uh, or if they're at an institution that, that hasn't traditionally had a, a substantial track record of success. Um, so having some seed funds from the institution or from the practice group uh, is really, is, is really uh, essential to be able to uh, let people um, hire, hire research staff or outsource uh, uh, biostatistical support um, and having uh, access uh, to other skilled personnel uh, like biostatisticians and just simply having office space informatics and other necessary tools. Further on, on, the, uh, on the point of funding, um, there's a number of different ways of uh, supporting uh, research that's done in a, in a department. Um, so there's salary support so provided to investigators um, but there's also incentive systems uh, that can be used. Um, so using a, a point system for research productivity uh, that's been done in, uh, in a number of institutions. Um, and so it also allows uh, physicians who, who don't have clinical salary support uh, to at least offset some of the, the, the time costs that they, that they spend doing research off the, the side of their desk. So, recognizing uh, and remunerating physicians for, for output. Uh, so research abstracts and publications, uh, it's something that's worked well in, in a number of institutions, uh, but that system should be transparent and robust and, and should also recognize other modes of scholarly output and uh, other ways of disseminating information, um, whether it's uh, blogs, podcasts, teaching modules, that kind of thing. Um, and then beware uh, that without transparency uh, and without input of the clinical uh, colleagues um, is, um, is, uh, can be perceived as punitive. Um, so it's very important to, to engage the entire clinical department um, in developing uh, some kind of system or practice plan uh, that can help uh, remunerate and incentivize people for scholarly output. Um, and so making sure that people see the value of what they're paying into um, is, uh, and how that furthers the, the mission uh, and vision of the department uh, is absolutely critical. So um, being, uh, being uh, democratic uh, in that approach um, and so those are the, the main points that uh, we've tried to develop for uh, um, department heads and program leads. Uh, so the input uh, that we're hoping to have from uh, call participants, uh, are we min missing anything or are there other ideas that we need to expand upon? 
Thanks very much, Andrew. Wise tips indeed. Just a couple of things I'm going to highlight here from the chat that's going on on the side. Uh, one from Dr. Jeff Perry in Ottawa, who just says providing an incentive program to reward clinicians for output is very helpful, uh, certainly in Ottawa. It fosters a lot of physicians to participate in lead research, and it helps improve collaboration of the non-stipended physicians to participate. And then uh, he also goes on to say uh, that funding positions without deliverables for sites, without people with a proven track record, is not often very successful. And so there's just one other uh, point that Patrick would like to bring up. So I'm going to throw it over to Patrick and then Phil will close our section. Yes, thank you, um, Shelley. Thank you very much. I, I think it's, uh, I wanted to congratulate my uh, uh, colleagues that have presented on our behalf for this panel. You, you did a, gr a great job at presenting all the tips that we uh, brought together. Um, and I, as I was listening to the, to the, to the panel, and I really thought that, um, uh, we did a great job at showing how we can uh, stimulate academic production and uh, uh, build being starting starting building and, and sustaining a, a research program. But I think that we also need to point to the important reason why starting building and sustaining a research program in non traditional academic centers is so important because. Um, Research is all about eventually generating knowledge that's going to help improve care and contribute to the to the growing learning health system that that we need to build across Canada uh, to generate the knowledge that's going to help us uh, fight COVID or or any new emerging health uh, health problems. So I really and what I think is that if we can sustain uh, uh, and build and sustain programs in in smaller centers in community based hospitals and in indigenous communities and in rural centers, will eventually be able to uh, generate knowledge that's more relevant to them and actually can become a much stronger network in uh, generating the knowledge that's needed to improve care. So I think that really needs to be the reason why this, this panel is so important. And I don't think we've um, brought that up uh, enough in, 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 our, uh, in, in what we've presented, but I think, um, uh, it's something to think about for the reason why this is so important. Okay, well, thanks, Jeff. Can I just have control just to advance to the QR slide again? Perfect, thanks. So I do appreciate everybody who came out and took the time to come and review the second panel. Um, uh, please, uh, if you can give us feedback using the QR code, I think it's open uh, until the end of the weekend. And so again, we're, we're looking uh, for thoughts and comments and, and feedback on does the temporal sequence uh, of these tips and recommendations make sense? Um, have we missed anything? Um, and really, are there any points that, that the audience feels we should elaborate on? Um, so. I'd like to thank you everybody for coming and I'd like to thank my panel for all the great work they did this year. Thank you so much. All right. So thanks very much, Phil, and thanks to everybody who uh, contributed to that panel. Um, fantastic feedback that we've uh, received from participants so far. Um, and so I, uh, I think the uh, uh, the manuscripts will be coming from this uh, that will incorporate that feedback are, are going to be uh, fantastic. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to hand things over uh, to Dr. Uh, Drs. Lucas Chartier and Stu Douglas, um, who are going to be uh, spending the final panel uh, talking about enhancing collaboration between Canadian emergency QI and research communities. Uh, so turn it over to them. I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Hi, Andrew. Thank you so much for um, uh, passing the baton to us. And thanks for the two previous panels. Um, I am trying to put my face on, not that you're missing much, but just I think for those of you who are in attendance, it may make a better, um, uh, a better experience. But now that I'm controlling your screen, somehow I'm unable to 
Uh, oh, there we go. Somebody has just enabled the function. I think it's Jeff. Thank you. Um, thanks again uh, to all of you. My name is Lucas Schreitz. I'm an emergency physician in Toronto, and I do a bunch of quality improvement, patient safety work in a variety of realms. Uh, and I am I'm, uh, very happy, thrilled to be here today. Uh, I'm going to see if this is working to move the slides up. It seems like it is. Um, first of all, thank you, Andrew and Jeff, for inviting us to be part of the research symposium this year. I think it's a testament to your vision, but also to the collaboration that have existed across uh, our teams and our communities over the last few years. And we're hoping to solidify that today with the all-star team that you have here. Uh, I want to first thank my uh, co-chair, Stu Douglas, uh, who I think is here right now. He's concurrently uh, uh, in the ICU and clinical service and has a challenging case that's coming his way a little earlier than expected and so may or may not be able to contribute in the way that he was meant to but has certainly been uh, an amazing force in our group over the last few years um, uh, last few years in general in this past year for this group uh, the team that we have and you'll hear from all of them uh, in sequence Antonia, Carmen, Davey, Layla, Lisa Calder is not with us. Unfortunately, we had, uh, uh, was not able to contribute today to the symposium uh, due to a conflict, but was able to help us over the, over the year and Sam Bayancourt. Um, maybe I'll ask all of you guys to, to give us a one-liner of, of what you do and, and uh, where you work uh, when it is your time. Um, on the next slide, you're going to see that we are going to use poll everywhere, and I'm going to have this in the next few slides. Uh, but while I'm talking, I would love for all of you who are in attendance, including the panelists uh, who uh, have preceded us, to use any of the um, functions here, either the website, pollev.com slash CAPE18. You can text CAPE18 to the number listed, 37607 or to use the Poll Everywhere app on your phone, again, with the same CAPE18 uh, um, code. Uh, we are really hoping to make this um, uh, an engaging um, uh, presentation in the sense that I would love to have your, your feedback in real time. There will be a survey as with the other panels, although in our preparation, we felt that the discussion and the back and forth may be something that we would benefit from in terms of improving our recommendations. And so please, please, please join in the conversation. Feel free to send in your thoughts. Uh, you, uh, If you join in right now, you may not see right away the questions and that's okay you're going to see them come up as we go through them so thanks in advance for doing this the rationale for our panel and and uh, you may have read the title i'm not sure that that i said it myself is to enhance collaboration between the canadian emergency department qi and research communities the rationale for doing this is obviously the, the research and the qi stream strive to advance human health and improve patient outcomes, whether it's by creating new knowledge or by iteratively and consistently applying it to the local setting, the goal is for better uh, patient outcomes and better health in general. And, and what's better location than a Canadian EM community to collaborate and maximize this? We have a strong, strong, strong uh, research community. I mean, the symposium today is testament to that, as well as the academic symposium, the CAPE conference, which has been and remains largely uh, research driven. Uh, we also have a budding QUIPS community. We actually had our um, visioning retreat this morning, the first one that we had after the first three years of our existence, where we had about 40 or so participants from across the country who joined in and were able to tell us what it is that they need from us, what it is that CAPE can do to help them. And so why don't we collaborate together in order to realize better uh, potential uh, or realize the potential that our communities uh, can, can, uh, can achieve? The method, similar to the other panels, as, as you've heard, we did have an expert panel. You've heard the names and you'll hear from them in a second, uh, composing primarily of staff and one resident in emergency medicine from six medical schools across the country. The positions of these people ranged uh, enormously, including heads of Department of Organization of Research and Quality Improvement, Patient Safety, Bodies and Experts. We tried to have a diverse panel, both in the um, personal and professional characteristics 
to make sure that we weren't missing anything. We uh, underwent the scoping lit review. We used our professional experience, our academic expertise in order to devise some recommendations or preliminary recommendations. We then had a national stakeholder engagement process, 14 research uh, and or QI expert that we reached out to, uh, people whose names uh, you would uh, recognize and identify quite quickly, mostly in the Canadian um, community, mostly not in emergency medicine because what we do in general is broader than our specialty. And we iteratively refine it over the last 10 months, culminating in today's presentation, where we're hoping to have some engagement from all of you to hear uh, what you uh, have to say about them. Our six recommendations are targeted to three different audiences or three different groups, the emergency medicine providers, that's all of us and all of our colleagues, the academic emergency medicine physician, a small group of uh, more committed uh, leaders who are doing research, who are doing quality improvement work, and the academic leaders, uh, I should also say the operational leaders that help them um, drive uh, their work. And you've heard from um, from Andrew just before and multiple people from the from the same in prior panels about how the, the infrastructure, the leadership, the commitment, the funding, the resources, all of these things are crucially important. And this is something that we need to keep in mind because if we just say to people, do it and work harder at it, it's not going to work. We need to structure them, to nudge them, to enable them. And we're hoping that some of our recommendations are going to get to it. I'm going to show them in a second. I'm going to literally flash them just for you to have a sense of what they are, although we will go in sequence to all of them. Um, and as I'm sure you stop listening to my voice and start reading what's on your screen, I'll just let you know that some of these may be slightly high level. They all have a, a description that the various uh, presenters are going to get into uh, that is a bit more pushing the envelope than what these relatively uh, mild recommendations may look like. We're really hoping to, to have some feedback both on this and in the, the more granular details. So without further ado, I believe I will um, be passing it to my uh, colleague and friend Antonia Stang. Um, you will see the first recommendation. Antonia, uh, please take it away. Hi, thanks, Lucas. I'm Antonia Stang. I'm an emergency physician uh, in the pediatric side at the Alberta Children's Hospital in Calgary. As Lucas mentioned, we're hoping to get some real-time feedback, questions, suggestions, etc., on these recommendations. So please use the Poll Everywhere software. As you can see on the responses that you put in are going to show up on the screen so that we can speak to them in real time. While I'm waiting for these responses to come up, I'm just gonna provide a little bit more detail about this recommendation. The first recommendation is that emergency medicine providers should understand the theory and application of both research and quality improvement science. So we know that in recent years, we've really developed very rigorous curriculum at both the undergraduate and postgraduate medical education level for research and research methodology. But we have yet to do the same for quality improvement. So our recommendation here is that there needs to be a joint effort between both experts in quality improvement and research to try to integrate this into the uh, academic curriculum so that they learn about both research and QI, where they're, where they're the same, where they're, where they're different, and how the two can really collaborate. Some of the things we thought of as examples, and I'd love if people could type in other, way, other examples of this that they can think of, were things like making sure QI literacy requirement for all trainees, providing comprehensive project and mentorship opportunities uh, for trainees, as well as making sure that for those who want to take a deeper dive, that we, they're adequately supported in terms of continuous professional development, et cetera. And I see that someone is typing, but how? So I'm answering some of our ideas for how, but I would love it if people listening could start typing your ideas for how. So those were some of the ideas we had for, for trainees. For providers already in practice, and we realize that's an area we sometimes forget about, those of us who've been in practice for a long time, what do we do uh, it, there. And then one of the things we thought about was making sure that there are continuous professional development resources available for QI. Um, I'm seeing lots of people saying, agreeing, understanding the general principles of theory and applications. Um, yes, someone's making the point that the curriculum needs to be embedded. So you learn about both research and QI together. And I think that's really important. And 
recommendation that it be integrated. And that's what we're going to talk about here throughout this session is some of the ways we see that there can be collaboration and integration between research and QI. And I think teaching that together is really a great idea. Talking about KIPS has been listed as a what requirement, but its application is varied. Maybe a collective agreement for curriculum. Yeah, so maybe some ideas, because we've done that sometimes with research a little bit, curriculum that kind of are shared. And that's certainly something we could do with QI, especially because I think QI is relatively newer and there are less people on the ground to teach it, particularly maybe at smaller sites. So that really, um, really resonates with me. Um, Lucas, uh, we lost our poll everywhere comments. Is that my cue that I'm supposed to move on? No. Okay. So I'm just going to keep on. It, it, it was not, and I'm not exactly sure what happened. We'll try to pull it back up. Pull I'm it back sorry. up. Okay. Sure. So I'll just keep talking yeah. while we do that. One thing that we've done at the Cape QI committee to start this kind of discussion and this practice and learning is we've created some QI resources to find on the Cape website. Um, it's at cape.ca backslash quips resources. So if you just go to the, and I, once the poll everywhere comes back up, I can, send that into the into the poll. Um, but that's somewhere people can look if they want to have introductory for now as we're just starting to build this, if they want to have some more introductory, uh, medium term and longer term resources for where you can learn more about uh, quality improvement. So if people are able to or interested in going to that uh, resource and then sending us more feedback on other resources they think would be uh, important. So we're just seeing these things come back up live and we're going to keep track of all of these uh, great um, comments because I'm seeing lots of really good stuff coming here. And I, I really that does resonate to me that these are required curricular elements for the Royal College. And I sat on the quality and safety when we redid CAN MIDS 2015. And I think that the Royal College endorsing this is a really big step. But sometimes we need a step between them endorsing it and how do we actually do it on the ground. Um, totally agree. Implementation is an important part of research and is a continuum. And I think we're going to talk about, it, talk about that a little bit later, how sometimes KT and implementation science and research and QI can all integrate and how we can best collaborate to move those things forward. And if you look there, I have the resource page that's just come up on the poll everywhere. Uh, yeah, and, and I get that. And I consider myself an older physician. And so that's something I think about a lot. We consider so much time on training and we're so good at in medicine and training and creating opportunities for our trainees, but we forget about ourselves sometimes. So I think the continuous professional development piece has to be really, really big. Um, understanding the theory seems a high risk for all providers. Yeah, no, that's fair. I think maybe understanding the role, the importance, the utility, and maybe some of the tools and resources. I think that's a fair feedback. I see Lucas nodding as well. Um, yeah, this, this is such great feedback. Thank you. I think uh, you can see we're all who put this together thinking as you put this. So please keep coming and do this for each of our recommendations. This is going to really and getting people's engagement and feedback is a core piece of the work we're trying to do. Um, introduction to quick seminars. Absolutely. And, you know, we could think about maybe a national curriculum where we, we, we try to provide some of this. These are the kind of ideas that are really great and I think um, would be really useful. That's perfect. Implementation does not equal QI. Yeah, I think sometimes um, I have to say that I think in the past we've spent a lot of time trying to define what is KT, what is research, what is QI. What and all these things. I think sometimes we need to think about a little bit, not just what are the differences, but where are the opportunities for collaboration between all these different things. Um, but the point's well taken that these there are that there are differences between QI research and implementation. And we spent a lot of time in our recommendations working through what those differences are. So um, you'll probably see that come through as we go on ahead. I'm cognizant of time, Lucas. How much more time do you want to spend on this, or should we kind of um, wrap up and move on to the next one. I feel like really, really great feedback. So maybe I'll- in Happy to uh, happy to move on. If you feel that we have enough uh, ideas, thoughts, I think some of them are a bit more uh, conceptual, others are a little bit more defined. Um, feel free for people in the last few seconds to continue to, to send in. I believe as we move to the next question, you may not be able to answer that specific question, but again, we'll have a QR code, we'll have a survey, and Antonia and the rest of the team would love to hear your thoughts again as you kind of think more through them. So uh, thank you so much, Antonia. Um, and I'll uh, pass it over to, I want to say Layla by memory uh, is the next person for the next recommendation. 
Hi, everyone. My name is Leila. I'm a fourth year resident in the emergency medicine program at MAC, and I'm just starting my master's in surgical science, which is focusing on QI and leadership. So I'm a bit green compared to the other big wigs on the team, but I'll give this a go. So the recommendation that I'm going to talk about is that academic emergency medicine physicians should actively contribute to both the broad dissemination and the local adoption of study findings. So as you guys are putting in your comments, I'm just going to give a bit of a rationale about this. So speaking first to QI. QI projects are usually completed with the primary goal of improving local care without the explicit consideration of broader implementation. And this is partly because QI projects often overlap with operational tasks. QI projects are generally conducted locally by individual professionals doing individual projects without institutional hubs to guide or share QI processes even between departments. And having multiple departments within hospitals and hospitals within regions that are all doing overlapping work without sharing their successes and failures is often inefficient and actually results in much waste. In contrast to QI, research generally does an excellent job of sharing its findings by contributing to practice guidelines and peer-reviewed papers. However, there is historically lower emphasis on translating these findings into practical and sustainable local impact. In order for both researchers and QI scientists to participate in both local projects and broad dissemination, we need to have easily accessible platforms for collaboration to work on care gaps that need further attention across the board. And this could be virtual or in another format. And this is one of the places where we want feedbacks um, from all of you guys about, you know, what kind of platforms can we use to share? Things that we've thought about are in the form of like quality improvement collaboratives where multiple sites can benefit from exchange of best practices or using the network of Canadian emergency researchers or something in person or um, which was in person would be like the Cape conference where we would share ideas together that way. So I'm seeing some comments rolling in uh, saying, yep, yeah, okay, in agreement. Uh, and that should it be the same people that are doing both or different people. So I think it, it could be both uh, or it could be both or different. I think that those are both correct answers. I think when we're talking about academic emergency physicians, the role is, you know, threefold, educating learners, excellent uh, patient care and advancing the field. And when we're talking about advancing the field, the ideal would be to do both. However, I, this is speaking in ideals. Seeing some more comments coming in about, yeah, speaking to knowledge translation versus QI. Yeah, so I think this is where we really need feedback from everyone about what, you know, what would be the optimal platform for sharing when it comes to both QI and research so that we can collaborate to, sh to share these successes and failures and incorporate um, both at the local and broad level. So I'm seeing some comments about ethics, about sharing data. So I understand where that's coming from that, you know, you may not necessarily be able to share the exact results of the, of, of the, you know, the PDSA cycles that were conducted, but I think sharing the methodology and which parts of, you know, the PDSA cycles worked well or which parts of a research um, project worked well and what didn't work well wouldn't necessarily be going into, you know, the like hospital specific projects. So I think that would be able to help get around the ethics of that. Um, I don't know if Lucas has any comments on, on that in particular. Um, I won't steal Sam's thunder. There's some uh, side discussions about RABs and, and how we can do even better. And Sam, by of course, is going to bring us through some of his thoughts uh, in a couple of recommendations. So I won't, uh, I won't add more now. Great. Yeah, so I think we're seeing some more comments about how maybe not all projects merit broad dissemination. So I'm not sure if I necessarily agree with that. I think that there's always something that we can learn from projects that are done at other sites. You know, even if you didn't find something from the project that you did, it's helpful for other sites to know that. So, you know, they're not necessarily repeating that same thing because this is what we often see, especially with QI, that all of these sites are completing the same project. They all don't turn out to be helpful or useful. Um, and we're wasting resources by, you know, repeating this at multiple sites and just not learning from each other. So I don't want to take too much time. I think that's probably 
covered most of the comments that we got here. Um, if Lucas, if we want to move on to the next section. You bet. Thanks, Layla. Really appreciate your contribution across the year. Oh, and we'll see uh, one more comment, a couple more. We'll, uh, we'll let Layla, we'll let you have a read of them and, and we'll have a, a copy, obviously, of those to make sure that we integrate into our recommendation. So thank you so much. Um, the next slide going to Davey for something that probably could spend, you know, an entire hour of discussion. Uh, no pressure, uh, Davey. Looking forward to hearing from you uh, what you think here. Thanks, Lucas, and thanks, Leila. Um, so I'm David Smarters. I'm a emergency physician here in Toronto, and um, I have a focus on quality improvement and innovation, uh, but more specifically, carving out my niche in operational QI. Um, and so our third recommendation here today it hasn't showed up, but I'll read it out just so we're all on the same page. Uh, quality improvement methodology should be leveraged by researchers to improve knowledge translation of study findings. Um, and as we get poll everywhere up and going, um, I'll just take a second to talk about kind of the spirit and the background of this recommendation and really how we came to this recommendation. Um, really where it starts from is just recognizing the knowledge translation gap, which we're all aware of, and uh, recognizing that it stems um, in part from um, a preference for peer-reviewed dissemination um, and frequently encountering implementation barriers when we even develop these clear clinical practice guidelines. Um, now, through this process of, you know, uh, developing this recommendation and interacting with our various stakeholders, uh, what we recognized was that clinical researchers have already adopted a lot of these uh, QI of approaches. So um, I know Dr. Perry earlier today mentioned, you know, including patients in the grant team, um, and that's very early on in the research process. Uh, Dr. Punai had mentioned, you know, including a KP specialist on your team and um, even including the open access fees on your grant. Um, and so uh, I think, you know, in the clinical research world, um, these um, approaches are already being adopted. Um, and really, this recommendation is just serving to encourage people um, to continue doing that. And so um, not only production of quality evidence, uh, but being able to translate those into sustainable process changes. Um, and so with our recommendation, uh, we do reference a table. Um, you know, we're not going to show that here today, but um, really that table, what it does is it outlines the research process and uh, attempts to suggest various ways um, suggest various ways um, that uh, clinical researchers can enhance um, the adoption of these QI methodologies. Now, um, I do see we have a comment here. Um, forgive me for squinting, but um, do you mean at the end of the project or at the beginning or through? Um, and so I would say it's actually um, more so through um, looking at various definitions, um, you know, I would reference the CIHR and uh, their uh, approach to knowledge translation. Uh, they do have end of grant knowledge translation, which we're very accustomed to, um, and then kind of more integrated knowledge translation, which um, I think is kind of the model we're all trending towards. I'm happy to kind of leave it there or leave it open to comments. Um, Davey, it's Lucas. Um, can I, it's my fault for not having included um, the table here. I think it would have helped you quite a bit with uh, demonstrating the, the hours that you put into, uh, you know, operationalizing this. Uh, it's easy to say to do it. Can you, and, and I'm 100% putting you on a spot with zero uh, planning or, 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 or forewarning. Can you give uh, the attendees one, maybe two examples of, of methods or approaches that could be used uh, and how this would uh, fulfill this? Again, I recognize that you haven't articulated this in your head before, so uh, we won't hold you uh, uh, to the quality of the answer, which I suspect will be tremendous regardless. I came prepared. So um, in terms of the table that we have, um, so development of a study question, so um, including the patients early on, um, so in co-designing the study, the grant, um, in terms of, you know, for example, the protocol development, 
um, and the intervention selected. So using iterative designs, um, I know when I had engaged with Dr. Punai during our process, um, he had hinted at this um, in a certain uh, respect. I think he specifically mentioned things like Bayesian adaptive methods, which I thought, I thought was very advanced. Um, other things, um, including in terms of the evaluation and analytical plan. So, um, you know, uh, looking at other methods such as run charts and statistical process control methods um, to identify special cause variation and, um, and using things like effectiveness implementation hybrid designs. Um, and then finally with scale spread and sustainability planning. Um, so given, uh, given considerations for micro, meso, macro level uh, context um, to ensure success and uh, replicability. Um, I will kind of just quickly deviate from your question, Lucas, just to read a few more comments, um, such as using PDSA type approach for in project knowledge transition. I would agree. Um, I would confirm that. Uh, I think this could be highlighted in project charters and proposals. Absolutely. Um, and I think it just takes some advanced planning. Um, to include some of these methods, because they can take a bit of time, uh, but they ensure that, um, you know, our knowledge translation down the road is that much more, um, you know, uh, effective and uh, meaningful. Um, sustainability is an important and emerging field uh, of implementation science, and I agree that QI is one part of this. Um, yeah, and absolutely. I think uh, QI is definitely a part of this. I'd love to hear, you know, other parts that you think uh, would be pertinent. Um, and hopefully we could address those going forward. How do you envision the QI teams and KT teams working together? Um, at several institutions, these teams are different. Uh, might need smoothing over uh, time to achieve. Um, you know, I'm not sure that uh, QI teams and um, knowledge teams, um, you know, there should be a clear divide. Um, and please, um, you know, anybody from our panel, feel free to jump in or otherwise from uh, the group. Uh, but, I, but I think that you should include both on your team um, with respect to uh, developing a project early on, uh, because I think they definitely bring, you know, perhaps different things to the table. Um, different methodologies and different approaches um, and could benefit the project in different ways. Um, in terms of smoothing over, um, really, um, you know, we've talked about leadership earlier today and um, I think in part of that, that is uh, the leader, the project leaders as well as um, the department leaders um, responsibility. Um, and um, I'm going to leave that one there. Happy to discuss that further though. Maybe thanks for um, your thoughts. And as I mentioned, your hard work, which I think will become only um, more obvious to those listening in uh, when they see the um, uh, correlations, uh, it's probably not the right term to be using with a research audience, uh, with uh, the, the type of uh, approaches, in, uh, both in the research and the QI world. Uh, and so uh, I think you probably have a couple of points here to, to move forward and we'll ensure to uh, have the table in the survey. Uh, Shana, feel free to to touch base with me, it might be too late if the if the survey has been is live already. Uh, anyone who's interested, please feel free to reach out. You will eventually see it. We'd love some feedback as well. Um, I'm going to try to move to the next slide, although it seems like I mess it up every time I try to move on, and it could just be Jeff in the background, kind of saving my uh, my butt. Um, and Stu is next uh, again. Stu may be called out uh, in a second for uh, some clinical duties, but we'll let him start, and I'll take over if uh, if he needs to go. Stu, take it away. Yeah, thanks, man. Uh, so hi, everybody. My name is Stu Douglas. Uh, I'm one of the eMERGE physicians in Queens. Um, and I'm, I sit as the uh, QIPS uh, lead in the department there. Uh, so the research, um, or rather the recommendation that I'm going to introduce to you guys, uh, specifically speaks to the academic uh, emergency physicians. Uh, and reads as researchers and quality improvement experts should ensure that the respective project outcomes prioritize patient care. Um, and at first glance, this is a bit of a high level, um, vague uh, recommendation. So in order to give a little bit of context, 
this sort of speaks to what Andrew McRae was speaking about in panel two, that uh, research programs should ultimately be uh, guided by a strategic vision. Uh, and we make the argument that um, researchers um, and uh, those who are academically productive should have as part of the pillars or as part of the guiding statements of the strategic vision, uh, prioritizing patient care. Um, as programs of research have developed in emergency medicine in the last while, uh, there are a number of different families or types of research uh, that have come out looking at health informatics, uh, health economics, and whatnot, and really uh, uh, we think that it's critical for, uh, or we make the argument that each project that is proposed should clearly outline its direct impact on prioritizing patient care. Um, if you look at uh, clinical research, um, traditionally, uh, we, we think that it's important to outline that from the start. And if you look at quality improvement, I think that uh, there's opportunity to make sure uh, that uh, the methodology is clear so that it's um, specific. Um, that was really the justification for this. Uh, I'll maybe wait a bit to see if anybody has bold comments. Uh, again, the survey monkey uh, or the survey will be available afterwards. So we're happy to hear your thoughts. Um, and if, uh, in particular for this recommendation, if you feel it's a targeted towards uh, maybe the inappropriate target that they should be directed towards the uh, organization leaders uh, and B, uh, whether or not it's uh, sort of too broad and a little bit difficult to implement. Uh, should they all do this is comment number one. And uh, we make the argument that uh, yes, that um, uh, patient care or patient outcomes should ultimately uh, be one of the guiding lights of a strategic vision for a program. Um, and your ability to uh, rationalize your impact on that, I think should be highlighted. If uh, that's the commentary, maybe Lucas, I'll uh, pass along to you and I look forward to seeing what you guys uh, do on the survey monkey. Thanks Stu uh, and also for making the time. Um, so I, I see the uh, now, of course, that we're trying to move on, the comments are, are, are getting in. Um, it might be uh, in interesting for us to think back as to whether the STEM itself isn't uh, targeting the right people or, or to the right goal. Uh, potentially with the description written up will be a little bit easier. Um, uh, Stu, do you wanna come back now that people are, are, are joining in to, to address these things? I'll pass it back to you for a few more seconds. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, so I totally agree. Um, maybe taking us throwing some aspirations on the more basic less applied research community. Uh, 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 very much so. I, I, I think that there's, um, I think it's important to have uh, an eclectic or a multi-focused uh, uh, research program, but uh, we argue that uh, patient care is ultimately, uh, um, should be a main driver. Uh, I totally support that patients have to be a function of the identification of their priorities uh, and would argue further that uh, you know, vulnerable populations or those not traditionally thought of should be uh, specifically targeted. Uh, provider level outcomes and process efficiency outcomes are important too. Totally agree. Um, uh, I don't think that uh, patient care uh, is in replacement of, but I think that it should, we again make the argument that this should be highlighted. Patient representation for QI2, sure. Awesome, Stu. So we got some uh, some people going at the end there, and I suspect that in the survey they may keep going. So thanks for making the time. Um, and um, well, I, I know you're gonna you're supposed to wrap us up at the end, but if you're not there, I'll do it. If, if your clinical duties are calling you away, um, I'll try to move on to the next one. And I think it is Sam uh, discussing the aforementioned uh, topic of REB. Sam, just start talking while I'm struggling here through the. All right, so 
Uh, recommendation number five. Um, so first of all, I'm Sam Vaillancourt. I'm an associate scientist at the Lee Caching Research Institute and also a quality improvement lead in our department at St. Michael's Hospital. Um, uh, so recommendation five is academic leaders should strive to enhance the infrastructure for oversight of research and quality improvement projects. So as mentioned previously, um, there has been a uh, big tangle between quality improvement projects and uh, research ethics boards where it's clogged up some research ethics board and it's really severely ham hampered a lot of people trying to do quality improvement projects that were not just operations projects. It's also hampered our way to disseminate that knowledge more broadly. Now on the flip side, increasingly research projects are also using um, usual care crude data. Uh, we're moving to data rich environments and for some research there's a very clear operations interface and there may be some projects in research also that should um, have some waiver from, uh, from research ethics board when they're no risk to patients or really minimal risk to, uh, to patient, usual risk to patient. So that's what we're pr proposing here is that instead of differentiating solely on the fact that uh, a project uses PDSA and QI methodology uh, and therefore is excused from uh, having to go through REB should really be a matter of assessing uh, like a basic assessment of, of risk as to whether it should be REB exempt or not. So what do you guys think? I see no brainer. That's a strong endorsement. <laughs> so strong support, obviously, this is not the kind of thing that we can change overnight or that the emergency medicine, uh, Right, anyone who's done it well. So I think there's, um, so uh, Alberta has um, uh, a bit um, of a process called the RETCHI, uh, the a Project Ethics Community Consensus Initiative. So, and I think it's trying to get at that. I'd love to hear from the Alberta people a bit more about uh, their process there and how it may be used by, uh, by the research community, uh, but, um, there you go. We've got some comments here. Risk of the data elements collected, for example, if there's no personal health information, just times intended to disseminate Arechi. Yeah. So, I mean, Arechi, I think, is a, is a nice uh, way if you go on the website to determine where, which pathway your, your project should take, uh, thus simplifying people's lives who are trying to uh, lead some projects that may uh, straddle the QI and, and, um, and research. Presentation from Auto Ethics Board, which nicely outlined it. So, if that could be uh, shared with us, we'd love it. At our at my center, um, there is a process called request, but that's just a VP of quality that really looks at the application, and it's usually based on process rather than patient risk. So that's what I think we should advocate for going away from what the methodology is towards. Is this something that subjects that poses any additional risk to patients? Sam, do you uh, feel like you have a little bit of thoughts and or, or uh, anything else you? Uh... We're hoping to kind of push the audience to, to think about. This is the last chance for someone to have something negative to say about this recommendation. So we can fix it. All right. Well, thank you. 
Thanks, Sam. Th this was awesome. And I see the comment that there was a presentation from the Ottawa Ethics Board, which ni nicely outlined it. So maybe we'll ask this individual who posted that to maybe send us a link or slide deck or some of the ideas, either to Sam, to myself, or, or to Shana, any one of you whose email address you can find uh, to be able to, to get it to us. Um, we had a discussion, as Sam knows, um, uh, and thank you to those who, who are just uh, adding in some specific wording changes. Uh, we had our, our visioning retreat for, for the Quips committee this morning, as I mentioned, and this was something that we discussed as well and trying to get a lay of the land and, and where can we advocate for a better process so that all of the people who are trying to improve their setting, whether it's through research, through QI uh, operations, uh, can do so in a way that's going to be ethically sound uh, and safe for patients and providers, but that doesn't uh, have some of the barriers that sometimes uh, some structures have uh, uh, enabled. Uh, there's an there's an ethical imperative, I, I would argue, to to improve the system in which we work. And patients are harmed by preventable harm every single day because of correctable flaws that we haven't tackled yet. Uh, and so we need to be enabling people to do this in a safe and and, and meaningful way. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Carmen is our uh, last uh, speaker. Carmen, uh, feel free to unmute yourself as I uh, struggle through. There we go. I'm getting better at this. Hi, everybody. I'm Carmen Rymack. I'm an emergency and critical care physician in Winnipeg. I have an interest in QI and a master's through Queen's University. And I do quality improvement um, as a program level for ICU and emergency as one of the chairs for the committees. Um, so we're going into our last recommendation number six here, and I'll read it out to you and give a little bit of elaboration. So academic leaders should encourage collaboration between researchers and quality improvement experts by ensuring that academic and operational infrastructures align and support both. We believe there are several ways this collaboration can be encouraged. And I hope that while I'm listing out a few that we have considered that you can try to let us know if there's any barriers or ideas that you can put into the chat. Um, we think that combining research and QI into a multimodal network wherever possible um, is ideal. Encourage and incentivize collaboration between research and QI and have a framework to match a clinical hypothesis or problem to optimal methodology. So kind of like we were talking about earlier where um, you identify a patient problem and decide whether this is suitable to primarily research QI or a hybrid. Linking academic performance with the diversification of an academic unit's portfolio can help encourage collaboration and integrating completion of local projects with academic productivity for promotion and professional development um, beyond focusing primarily on um, academic peer review publication, but performance in the local realm. And then securing funding from innovative and, innovative and diversified sources can be very helpful, um, especially because QI may open up opportunities to have more local funding um, especially through operational funds and other hospital line funding. Whose job is it to do that? Research director, ED chief, division head, or hospital leaders? Uh, I think that's a great question. And um, I think it's our responsibility as researchers and QI um, leaders to identify that this is a job that needs to be done and that it's all of our responsibility to promote um, collaboration, and then who it actually falls upon will depend on how your um, institution is organized. Um, I'm starting off as, for example, a QI lead in our place, and we have a new research director, and we're trying to build um, a program where we're working together already on projects, and um, I think it depends where your champions are in your institution. Uh, where they will come from. I think the methodologic barriers are more important than the infrastructure barriers. So that's a good point that we should bring back and kind of dissect a little bit more. Um, I would encourage whoever made that comment too in the survey to give a little bit more elaboration. Um, there's definitely overlapping methodology, but we don't want to pretend that QI and research are one and the same. Um, it's just the earlier you try to uh, integrate the two 
the more likely your project at the end will be able to be a successful QI project and a, a robust research project. Interesting, makes sense. All right. Um, any other comments rolling in? No, easier said than done, of course, as many of these recommendations are. So um, we will have in our kind of final product a little bit more um, information on each of these. But I think local frameworks will take time to build and just starting the discussion like in a forum in this way is really exciting. And I'm, I've been happy to be part of this myself. And I think there's a lot um, that we can do together. Thanks, Carmen. Um, and I would also encourage the person who wrote that the methodological barriers are more important than the infrastructure ones to uh, flesh out their thoughts in the survey. That'd be really helpful. Um, I happen to disagree with that statement, but I recognize that it's easy for me to to explain why without having the other person be able to engage into a dialogue. And, and I'm sure that I'm probably wrong at at least 50 plus 1%. And so would love to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, that's a whole point. It's challenging, obviously, to have a back and forth here, uh, but we'd love to hear more because uh, because that's really an important thing. And, and we need to understand this fundamental issue if we are to, to, to devise structures, as Carmen said, uh, that are going to help all of us. Um, I'm going to go to the next um, slide, and I think Stu uh, has uh, has um, left to go back to uh, clinical care duties. Um, and Jeff, I'm not sure if I'm able to go back to um, to my slides. Really, there isn't too much there, I don't think. So I can just wrap it up before I pass it back to Andrew to uh, uh, to wrap us off. Um, oh, there we go. So this is the cute. Thank you. Oh. There we go. Okay. Uh, it's like magical movement. Um, uh, thank you a million, a million ways to our panel members, to Jeff and Andrew uh, for enabling this to happen in the first place, to Stu, uh, who has been um, uh, my co-chair and a huge driver of, of this work in our community, in our field, and through this project. Feel free to log into it with a QR code. I should move the um, the... Um, the arrow here, um, uh, I'm not sure if you can see mine. Uh, the QR code for the survey, we will, uh, through Shauna, include the table that Davey was referring to. Apologies that it is not already. Feel free to send your questions, your concerns, your issues um, to uh, any and all of us. Uh, this has been an absolute pleasure, and we're really hoping that through Andrew's uh, vision, Jeff's vision, and, and all of the team and the panelists that have preceded us, we can continue to build a stronger community, all of us together. This paper and this project is just the start of the discussion, and we probably didn't get it right. We definitely did it, and in true QI uh, methodology, we'll, we'll approve and we'll iterate until we get it right. Feel free to let us know how to do that. Um, I think that this, uh, the next slide is just a thank you slide. I'm gonna pass it back to you, uh, Andrew. Uh, thank you again uh, for, your, um, uh, for your invite. Thanks, Lucas. Um, thank you everybody for joining us and contributing to a, a fantastic discussion today. Um, like I was saying earlier, it's too bad we weren't able to see each other face to face, but this uh, virtual symposium, I think, uh, has been a, a pretty fantastic exchange of ideas that uh, that exceeded a lot of expectations. And so um, three great presentations, some fantastic feedback and comments for us to take back and incorporate into our symposium papers. Um, and so keep an eye on uh, those. Uh, uh, keep an eye out for those in CGEM in the coming months. Um, so thank you again to all of the panel uh, panelists and to all the participants in today's discussion, uh, to Shanna and Kelly from the Cape Head Office, uh, to Jeff Allen for coordinating the, uh, the AV co uh, contents and making everything work so smoothly. Um, again, uh, uh, glad that everyone was able to, to join us. And looking forward to seeing you all again in person or virtually sometime soon. Thanks, everybody. That's our show for today.